All right. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining this Disruptive Innovation Festival Big Top 10 Interactive Webinar. For those of you unfamiliar with the DIF, the Disruptive Innovation Festival is an online open access event that invites thought leaders, entrepreneurs, businesses, designers, makers, and learners to explore the question, the economy is changing, what do I need to know, experience, and do? I'm Natalie Sarace, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, our topic experts joining me today are Ava Labuzetta and Mizzy Hall. Uh, they are our pollution prevention engineers here at RIT. And we also have Dr. Tom Trable, head of sustainability department here at RIT. Uh, today's session is purely a Q&A, so uh, we have a few questions that we're going to answer that have been submitted already. And if you want to join us in submitting questions, please do so via the comment section on the DIFF page that you're currently watching on. Um, and we will answer as many questions as we can. So the first question that we have in here from our audience is, how could a biorefinery concept be applied in developed countries? Okay, I guess I'll field that one, uh, Natalie. Um, a biorefinery is a concept that's akin to a petroleum refinery wherein all of the products from a waste energy process are effectively utilized and valorized. Um, for example, if we talk about um, anaerobic digestion, where we would convert food waste in the absence of oxygen to produce primarily um, methane-enriched uh, biogas. Uh, there's actually a number of different co-products that could be developed from that system. For example, the biogas could be used to generate electricity. The biogas could be utilized directly in a boiler to produce steam for, for example, a food processing plant. Uh, conversely, the biogas could be uh, cleaned up and used in uh, compre compressed natural gas vehicles. Um, but even beyond just the biogas fraction, there's other products that could come out of the system, such as um, animal uh, bedding from the digestate that comes out as an effluent from the system. Also from that um, digestate stream, we could extract uh, liquid fertilizer. So now instead of thinking of just producing electricity from the biogas, we could have electricity, heat, cow bedding, and liquid fertilizer. And then when we're, we're looking at all those valorized product streams, the economics of these systems looks much more attractive. All right, thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question that came in. Um, someone's wondering about up and coming solutions. So, are there any up and coming solutions that you see for food waste that businesses are implementing or that you see becoming a possibility in the future? Um, yeah, yes, definitely. There are a lot of up and coming uh, technologies. I would also say that um, before I get into those, though, we see a lot of success at businesses currently that um, are really built around putting a team together that's, you know, a, a champion of reducing food waste at their business. So um, a lot of times, though, there are more high tech, uh, newer technologies coming out. Uh, a lot of times um, it really comes down to uh, getting a lot of people on board and on the same page and motivated to reduce food waste at their business. And, We've seen that that's where the success really stems from currently. And I would expect that to continue. Um, but in terms of up and coming um, more technologies, definitely uh, I would say tracking software is one that comes to mind. So this is this allows a business to actually measure way and in a lot of cases um, even photographs, so they have an image of what's going into the trash. Um, so this allows really fine characterization of all the food that's going into the garbage. And this allows them to then use that data to understand where it could be prevented in the first place. So this is great for um, prevention techniques, which are always the, the highest priority, really, and also where you find the most cost savings. Um, so tracking technologies are one. Uh, 
I would also say that uh, finding a monetary value out of a um, what would be a waste is another up and coming uh, thing that we've seen with food waste as well. Um, so for example, extracting a certain nutrients from a vegetable food waste and um, selling it as maybe part of a vitamin or something like that, where now you have a, a revenue stream instead of just a waste. So that's something that's been expanding that businesses are obviously very interested in from an uh, economic standpoint as well. Um, so those two come to mind. They're also um, sort of on-site pre-processing units that we've seen pop up recently as well. Um, so rather than sending your waste to a centralized um, location to then be ground or what have you for um, preparation for another process, we've now seen on-site um, even grinding technologies that make your, your waste into a slurry that then is a lot easier for, say, a digester to come and, and pick up. So that's something we've recently seen. Um, what else? Anything else you can think of? <laughs> I, guess, I guess I would just to add to what Ava said, there is really a, a, a renewed interest in on-site um, deployment of technologies because um, that enables the food waste generator to extract the embodied energy and water from the food waste as opposed to just sending it to a centralized facility um, and having somebody else uh, enjoy the economic benefits of that um, waste material. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would add also is there's um, greater interest in applying um, tools for environmental analysis like life cycle assessment where uh, a food waste generator may have a number of different options at their disposal and there's an interest in understanding what's the most economically beneficial but also the most um, environmentally beneficial in regards to reducing greenhouse gas emissions yeah. so that, that's another technology area that we see um, um, expanding in this area thanks tom um i also thought of one more we've seen um and this is in regards to making donations, actually. So if you have edible food that just isn't eaten for whatever reason at your business, a lot of times a challenge for businesses is to be able to find somebody in a, in a timely manner to come and either pick that up or even somewhere to take it themselves. So we've seen um, apps actually pop up that that make that connection for people. So you can post directly when you have something available and somebody in real time can respond. And that's been really helpful for um, the communities where we've seen this to be able to make those connections and, and uh, put that food to use. All right. Thank you guys. Um, so one of the, another question that came in came from a grocery store owner. So he said, as the owner of a grocery store, how can I find the best process to recycle my food waste? So any recommendations for grocery stores specifically? That's a really great question. Uh, I think grocery stores are in a unique position um, because they have a lot of different types of waste. So in addition to you know fresh fruits and vegetables that have gone bad, they also have packaged waste, you have bakery waste, you have prepared foods, you have um, in some cases, if you have a cafe, there's post-consumer waste as well. And each one of those may have an ideal, a uh, different outlet that's the ideal scenario. But in a lot of cases, there may not be all of those outlets available. Um, so it comes down to cost and what's um, around you. Uh, one way to um, get a better idea of what your waste looks like and those ideal scenarios is understanding the amount of waste that you have, the types of waste, and um, what characteristics you have on site and in your region. So uh, in upstate New York, we have a lot of dairy farms, so there's anaerobic digestion available. In other cases like urban areas, composting may be a better alternative. So it's important to know what your specific site looks like. There's not a one size fits all scenario for all grocery stores or all food waste generators. All right. 
So again, um, if any of you watching have questions, please feel free to submit them via the comments on the page and we will answer them live. Uh, the next question that we have that's been submitted is, um, so Tom, you mentioned specifically in one of the three videos that we had, uh, several food waste energy technologies. So can food waste be sent through these processes as is, or does it have to be prepared in some way beforehand? Okay, that's a very good uh, and relevant question. Um, generally speaking, if the, if the waste material is reasonably homogeneous and um, comes in at a more or less constant flow rate, uh, they can usually be sent directly into the waste energy conversion system. However, unfortunately, that's not often the case. In many, many uh, situations, you have um, materials that are, are very non-homogeneous uh, in terms of composition and flow rate. So there often has to be some kind of pre-processing or pre-treatment step. Um, for example, an anaerobic digestion system, at least most commercial systems, rely on the material being at least semi-liquid or like a slurry. So it has to be pumpable. So for those kinds of materials, there normally has to be some kind of pre-grinding or homogenization step to create preferably a slurry type material that um, is more uniform in composition and can be effectively pumped. Um, an, another example is with, say, a thermochemical conversion process like um, pyrolysis, where we're um, heating the material to high temperature in the absence of oxygen. In those situations, we want material that has a uniform moisture content, preferably low moisture content coming in. So you're, you're limiting the amount of thermal energy that goes into heat of vaporization. And also we want reasonably small particle size because without small particle size, then there's a big temperature gradient between the outside of the particle and the inside of the particle. And that can impact the properties of the final um, uh, products, whether it's syngas or bio oil or biochar. Um, the other thing I would uh, point out is that uh, packaged food waste is a particular problem because here we have to separate the organic material from the packaging material. So that of course has um, significant cost implications, but in so doing, you also then have to worry about what to do with the packaging. So now you have packaging material that has residual food on it. So there has to be a cleaning step and then you also have to have a market for those packaging materials. And at least in the US, the market for waste paper is, is not uh, very attractive right now. It's better for aluminum. Um, and then some materials like glass have almost no market at all, or in fact, pretty difficult to recycle. So um, uh, again, just to, to reiterate, packaged food in particular is, is a uh, significant problem. And certainly with those kinds of materials, um, you would need some type of upfront pre-treatment or pre-processing. Although I would um, mention that there's current interest in looking at technologies that may be able to process everything together. And again, I would point to thermal chemical conversion where in principle, you could put a say, food material like, um, let's just use as an example, uh, bagged lettuce. In principle, you could take that material and throw the entire thing, lettuce plus plastic packaging into a pyrolysis process and then convert everything at once. There's fundamental knowledge that's needed on what does that mixture do to the quality of the co-products, but at least in principle, that's a way that you could deal with that material. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely good to know for the businesses out there that are looking to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, so Ava, I want to ask a follow-up question on um, the previous answer that you had. For up-and-coming solutions, you were saying you were talking about tracking software. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that and for those companies that really want to get involved in tracking their waste, um, are there good solutions out there? Yeah, um, so one that comes to mind 
there are a few out there. One I would mention is uh, Lean Path. So this, um, how it really works is, so if you're working in the kitchen and you have a, um, you know, a container of food that you're about to throw out, maybe it's gone bad, um, the system has a scale and a built-in camera or um, you know, some kind of camera. So you weigh the food and the container, um, you subtract out the container weight and it takes a photo of what you're actually throwing away and it logs all this information. So by day, by week, by even like time of day, you can then see um, exactly what's going into the garbage. And I think that there may be ways to put, I'm sure that there are ways to put in comments too. So you could say, you know, why something was actually thrown away. Maybe it expired on the shelf, maybe it was dropped on the floor or it wasn't covered in the walk-in or whatever the reason is then that having all that data and being able to go back and look at it and um, aggregate it in ways that are meaningful to you uh, can help you understand where your prevention um, uh, strategies can really come into play. You can also do a strategic self assessments. So if you want, if you don't want to log um, all of the time, you can still go in and basically do a self audit every once in a while and check through the garbage to see what's there or through your compost bin if you're already composting. Um, and then you can track your progress that way. So once a month, once a quarter, you can take a look to see if anything's changing as you go forward as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another alternative. And there are uh, tools available online for doing those kinds of things. Yeah. And I, I also wanted to mention, we've seen too, um, just that having a visual of what's being thrown away is really important. So even if you're not ready, if you're not at the step of investing in a software or something, um, it, we've seen people just use clear bins and put them on uh, their workstations and use those as a garbage. And even though at that point it's still going into the garbage afterward, you see, you actually see like a layer of what exactly is in there. And that in and of itself can be helpful. So just wanted to add that. Okay. So yeah, I definitely think that that's good to know. Um, we've talked a lot about businesses. You were mentioning some uh, different things that individuals can do in their office. How about some things that they can do at home? Are there any good tips for those that are watching that might want to get involved in things like composting or uh, other ways of reducing their food waste? Well, like this one. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of things you can do. Um, I, I guess I'll start with a few. Um, I, what I've found to be very helpful is um, just simply cleaning your fridge out before you go to the grocery store. A lot of waste comes from uh, duplicate purchases. So you may not remember if you have a carton of eggs already, but if you go through your fridge before you go, um, make note of what you actually need. So make a list and then get exactly what you need. Uh, that helps a lot. Um, storage also is huge. I find if you put, um, if something's about to go bad and you throw it in the freezer, then you automatically get, you know, a few months more uh, life on it. So um, proper storage and also using free, uh, a freezer if you can to extend life mm -hmm. is helpful. I, I always like using a list before I go to the store. And if I go to the store hungry, then I certainly buy a lot more food that I don't necessarily need. But um, if we menu plan um, for the week, then we go and we buy exactly what we need. You check the fridge before you go. Um, as well as, so just like in a business situation, even if you're still throwing it away, just that conscious effort of, documenting either mentally or on paper what you are putting into the garbage so next time you know um, hey i really don't need a full loaf of bread maybe i can just buy half um, so for next time you know you're learning from from what's happening yeah um a creative solution we've seen too is having a eat first box in your fridge so just some sort of container you put towards the front of your fridge and anything that's soon to go bad, maybe it's herbs or something that doesn't have a long life, put in there and then you try to use those in mm -hmm. recipes before they go bad and they don't get, um, you know, lost in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a technique that we've uh, used, which I guess is an extension of what um, 
Missy mentioned is that not only do you keep track of what you discard, but you translate that into a cost. And that annoys my wife to no end. But, um, I find that to be pretty effective because we all know that food waste is something we should not be contributing to, um, but it especially um, drives it home when you can also apply a, a, a monetary cost to that to that waste. Yeah, and there, um, community composting uh, scenarios are popping up a lot more. Um, so it's worthwhile to look into to see if there's anything going on locally that will either come pick up your compost, your food waste for compost, or if there's a place that you can go take it. And it, it could be that nobody's just asked the question. And if you ask the question, it may spur that discussion for something to go into your local community. And um, in some places you may be able to compost right at home. Um, that's what I do. I don't right. do a great job, but at least my food waste is going to a different use. So. So one thing I'm thinking is that uh, it sounds like smart technologies might start making a difference here. Uh, there are smart fridges now that have come on the market that um, will monitor the food that you're putting in the fridge when you run out, when things are going bad. Um, can you tell us anything about uh, how you think smart technologies might change that going forward, might help us reduce food waste? So, well, yeah, I had, uh, if, uh, I'll, I, I guess I'll go first. One area that's an active area of research is um, package level monitoring um, to really uh, quantify expiration date, if you will. We all know that expiration dates are, are uncertain at best. And because of those expiration dates, a lot of food is discarded that probably doesn't need to be. But there's a lot of interest now in actually putting sensors on package, packaged food directly to monitor um, whether or not the food is edible. And in all likelihood, that kind of technology will have the effect of extending um, shelf life of packaged food. And something that's maybe not smart technology, but a way that we're using technology is helping to, um, I guess, do more matchmaking. So uh, take down that communication barrier to connect people with available food or matching waste generators with uh, waste processors. And, you know, it may not be your next door neighbor, but through even Facebook groups, um, apps, as Ava mentioned, um, we're starting to see more and more connections being made um, to, to recover that food. So I, I could see that happening a lot more in the future as well. Yeah, just in that same context, I would add that, <clears throat> that information flow and education are critically important. Even when we talk about, certainly first from the standpoint of just simply reducing food waste, but even when waste is produced and it's unavoidable, there will always be some degree of waste, but educating the public on some of these valorization technologies is really important because the, the average person would not understand that there's things that you can do with these materials other than send them to a landfill. And they're things that enhance the value of the material and may even benefit them personally. Mm -hmm. So I think getting that education out there and making sure, um, especially among say school age children and get develop their knowledge from an early age of alternatives to um, treating these materials at the end of life um, is really very important mm -hmm. in solving this problem. And Ava also mentioned earlier about tracking software um, that different solutions are coming up for um, either on-site treatment or pre-treatment um, or just containers, et cetera, solutions that have technology embedded into them so you can track the data, so you have data associated with the effort. And uh, we're seeing more solutions come on board that have that piece so people can improve upon what they're generating. Okay, um, yeah, that's it. So here in the US, for those watching from abroad, uh, we certainly have a big issue with landfills. So food waste is um, an issue that we really need to work on solving. 
Um, are there any, to really work home, why this is such a big issue, are there any statistics that you can give us um, that will, like for example, I know that uh, an EPA report released recently said that we actually waste 40% of the food that we produce. Um, where exactly is that food being wasted? Is it being wasted at the farm level? Um, is it wasted in manufacturers? Um, so what can you tell us about that, where it's actually wasted? Um, well, so food's wasted all along the food chain, really from the farm down to the household level. But if you break it down um, by sector, the majority definitely comes from households and from businesses, uh, consumer facing businesses. So um, food manufacturers typically have a high recovery rate of um, their food waste. So even if they are producing food waste, which they usually are, um, they have come up with some solution either on site or off site to deal with that effectively. Um, then those that efficiency really drops off when you get to the uh, consumer facing business level and the household. And actually the largest section is from the household level. So, um, you know, in a way that's, that's definitely good to know because um, as an individual, sometimes it, it can feel like a large problem that you might not be able to have an impact on, but the largest amount of food waste comes from the household level. So, um, as far as other stats, I mean, food waste, it's not, when you're talking about food waste, it's not just the waste, the material itself, but it's everything that goes into the food that's wasted. So um, all the embodied energy, all the embodied water, transportation to get it from point A to point B. And now that we're, uh, as populations move um, away from where the food is being grown, that transportation, need grows as well and um you know when you add all of that together it's a, it's a huge environmental problem all right thank you guys well that is unfortunately all the time that we have for today um so i would really like to thank ava messi and tom for taking the time today to answer some questions uh, for those of you watching who have more questions please feel free to write those down on the comments in the comment section um, and we will continue to answer those through the comment section uh, as time goes on even after our webinar. So um, as a reminder, you can learn more about our, um, our efforts in food waste at rat.edu slash nysp 2 i slash food. I know that's a long link. I will post that in the comments as well for those of you that are interested. Um, so thank you again. And remember that this session will be available on catch up along with all of the other diff sessions. Uh, on the website thinkdiff.co. So thank you again to those that are watching and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.